What if the world was lost to the machines and the only ones who could stop it were Batman and Superman? This is World's Finest, a series showing us the early days of Batman and Superman, and in those early days, things got weird. So today we're covering World's Finest 13, 14, and 15. This is Comic Story, and I make audio dramas of your favorite comic books so that you know what to add to your collection. Let's get into it. Our story begins with the ending of another story. The world's finest have finally figured out that Batmite and Mr. Mixel Pitalik were pretending to be Batgirl and Supergirl. Luckily, they had help from Jimmy Olsen, whose camera had revealed the truth. As Jimmy heads back down into the Daily Planet, he's met by mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent. He informs him that the Chief is a new story for them to investigate. The apparent murder of billionaire industrialist Simon Stagg. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin are returning to Gotham when Alfred gets word to them about Stagg's murder. Batman immediately turns the Batmobile around. Turf being turf, isn't that more like a job for Superman? Robin asks, but Batman shakes his head, pointing out that this involves a common friend of theirs. Rex Mason, who's that? Jimmy asks as he and Clark near Stagg's hotel. And Clark explains to Jimmy that Rex Mason was an adventurer that fell in love with Stagg's daughter, Sapphire. But Stag thought Rex wasn't good enough for his daughter and sent him on a mission to Egypt, where he would be murdered by Java, Stag's butler and goon. Left for dead, Rex discovered the Orb of Ra, a radioactive meteor that transformed his body into something not human. Returning to Sapphire, she spent months teaching Rex how to be human again, but now his body was different, and he became metamorpho. The Element Man, able to transform his body and create any element on the periodic table. The two reporters arrive at the murder scene, but they're quickly turned away. And Clark looks up as he spies Batman and Robin slipping into the hotel. With a nod, he turns to his friend. Listen, Jim, there's a murderer on the loose, and if you're willing to share it with me, that story could be your first byline. Are you interested? Clark asks, and Jimmy agrees enthusiastically. Get to work. Dig up some suspects. Above all, concentrate on who benefits. No matter how unlikely, Clark tells him, before heading off, promising that he'll be working the story from a different angle. Seconds later, Superman arrives in the hotel room. Aren't you going to be late for dinner? Superman asks Batman, who turns to his friend, explaining that the hotel room is a classic locked room mystery. That Stag was poisoned. That the room was locked from the inside and there is no sign of a delivery system. Rex Mason was last seen with Stag. If Rex's patience has ended, that's motive, means, and opportunity. Superman doesn't agree, not believing that Rex would suddenly turn into a murderer. Let's hope, but it's a lead we can't ignore. Batman tells him, and Superman turns his supervision to the city and finds Rex nearby. Meanwhile, at the Metropolis History Museum, Egyptian Wing. Robbers have slipped inside with gear from Quakemaster, and as they begin to load artifacts into containers, they are suddenly trapped by an iron cage slamming down upon them. The cage is connected to the metal arm of Metamorpho. Sign says, do not touch, boys, the hero jokes, but then he looks around. Hey, weren't there three of you? He questions, and in the next room, the third goon is trying to escape, but stumbles into the dark night. Drop the weapon. The goon turns his quake gun on Batman, bringing down the building around them. As Batman rushes to stop him, the museum is full of a red and blue blur. The security guards and priceless artifacts are quickly saved. Batman is about to stop the goon, but is interrupted as Metamorpho is suddenly there, slamming the thug into the ground. Allow me, Batman! Rex jokes. And after the goons are captured, Batman and Superman fill Rex in on what's happening. Rex, in light of our long friendship, I'll level with you. I need you to account for your afternoon. Rex quickly becomes angry. I went to helium. I was floating around the city, taking in the sights. Are you calling me a suspect? Rex demands, but Batman sighs, turning away. I'm just doing my job, Rex. Give Sapphire my love. But Jimmy is still working on the story on his own, tracking down every lead that he can and speaking with Sapphire's stack. And that's when he comes to one conclusion. He brings his work to Clark the next day, but Kent doesn't believe it. You must have missed something, Jim. He's not guilty. It's not in his nature. Clark tries to explain after looking over all of Jimmy's research, but Perry White backs Jimmy's investigation. There's something you're not saying, Kent? Do you have any reason to believe this man is innocent? He can't have done this, not him. 
Clark repeats. But without evidence, Perry orders Clark to run with Jimmy's story. The next day, it's all over the front page. Bruce Wayne is arrested for Stagg's murder. The next day, Bruce is talking to Clark over their comms. This is what you get for pretending to be a flighty playboy who flits around. It's much harder to establish an alibi, Clark tells his friend. But Bruce doesn't find that amusing, pointing out that this is going to make it harder for them to find out who really killed Stagg. As now, Bruce Wayne will have to remain in the public eye. Disappearing for long periods of time will make him look guilty. Congratulations! In the middle of a murder investigation, your blunder has hobbled Batman. Bruce snaps, turning back to his computer. The killer is potentially Metamorpho, who we would have to locate before we could even clear him. Don't you wish you had a detective as a partner right now? Bruce asks, but Superman is standing in the Fortress of Solitude. Oh, I found one. He says, turning to Robin with a thumbs up. With a sigh, Bruce ends the call, heading up to the manor, where Alfred informs him that he has a call from Oliver Queen. Bruce sighs louder, sitting down to the call, and is shocked when Oliver Queen offers to invest in Wayne Tech's artificial intelligence program. You? What happened to you? You don't trust machines smarter than your toaster. Bruce questions, but Queen tells him that he's at a change of heart. Bruce begins to ponder on this and ends the call, turning around and heading back down into the cave to follow up on some leads. Meanwhile, Superman and Robin have tracked Rex to Venezuela, where the hero has been hunting down all of the villains that might be trying to frame him for Stag's murder. They fly down to find Rex fighting against El Montanez and his robot army. Superman immediately leaps in and begins to fight the robots while Robin grapples the dictator from behind, dangling him off a roof. I don't care who started this, you're putting villagers in danger. Hit the brakes. But the dictator reveals that he's been trying to shut the robots down. The controls, they're malfunctioning, he shouts, but Rex begins to help the villagers, transforming his body into a firefighting foam to put out the flames, while Superman continues to fight the robots, throwing them into space. Afterwards, Rex transforms his fists into hammers, rushing at El Montez. But he's stopped from his assault by Superman. Enough, Rex! Superman calls out as the hammers slam harmlessly into his chest. And Rex steps away, unhappy. I was just gonna scare him, Boy Scout. Is that okay with you? I need to know which of these creeps was paid to frame me! But Superman promises that they are working on the issue as he picks up the other two heroes and flies back to Metropolis. Meanwhile, Bruce has been on the phone with several of his billionaire associates, still following up on a hunch. But later, he then puts in a call to Clark, who's attending Stagg's funeral. Bruce, I'm at the service, Clark says after stepping outside. We have a situation, Bruce tells him, quickly explaining that he has put calls to several billionaires and believes that they have all been replaced. Clark turns using his supervision to look through the coffin and is surprised to find that Stagg is actually an android duplicate. Later, Batman, Robin, and Superman, and Rex all convene on the rooftop of the Daily Planet. Someone's kidnapping billionaires and replacing them with puppets, Superman recaps. Batman nods, digging into their finances. Enormous sums of money have suddenly been funneled to one offshore account, Professor Ivo. But Batman quickly points out that Ivo's creations would never pass for humans. You and Robin, see if you can follow the money. Rex and I need to find Dr. Will Magnus. Batman says as the group disperses. Superman and Robin track Ivo to a lair in the Alleghany Mountains, where they are disconcerted to find several androids hanging from hooks in the shadows. Robin jumps back as they pass an unfinished Bruce Wayne android. Presumably, it stopped being useful to Ivo once Wayne was a murder suspect. Correct, Superman. Ivo's voice calls in the darkness around them. All of the androids come to life, turning their glowing eyes to the Man of Steel as he explains that the androids are everywhere and they're sending money to Ivo. The androids begin to walk across the room, closing in on the two heroes. Keep talking, Ivo. Confession is good for the soul. Your marionettes aren't a threat to me. Oh, I know. They're for the boy, Ivo says, bringing a look of shock to Robin's face. Meanwhile, Batman and Rex have arrived at Will Magnus' home, but they find the doctor is missing and there's a sign of a struggle. I don't get it. If he was abducted by Ivo, why didn't his metal men protect him? Batman ponders. But they turn, quickly finding several cauldrons of melted metal. Help us! A voice hisses out of the molten liquid metal. Meanwhile, back at Ivo's, Robin takes a step back. Now would be a good time for some heat vision, don't you think? I wouldn't say no to freeze breath either. 
The boy wonders, whispers. Superman quickly stumbles, falling to his knees, with Ivo continuing to talk, revealing that he wanted to frame Rex Mason. But to do so, he needed to create an android that could replicate Rex's powers. Then I thought, why stop there? Mason can replicate only the elements of the human body. Better for me to command a creation that can transform into any element on the periodic table and beyond, including kryptonite. Ivo says as a new android steps out of the shadows, punching Superman with a kryptonite fist, slamming him into the ground. The android rears back, punching Superman again with the kryptonite fist. I call him Ultramorpho, a biomechanical construct capable of mimicking any element, including the one that can kill you! Ivo's voice informs the heroes. Robin doesn't hesitate, throwing two grenades that blow up the ceiling, briefly burying Ultramorpho. Come on! We gotta get you out of K-Range! Robin shouts as he rushes forward, pulling Superman to his feet. The two of them begin to limp away. Oh my! How far do you fleshlings think you can run? Ivo asks them, but Robin is confused, believing that Ivo is a human. That's definitely his voice, but... Superman tries to explain, but they don't get far before the Ultra Morpho explodes through the ceiling, his whole body now transformed into Kryptonite! Superman stumbles back, collapsing into Robin, who steps forward to block his friend. Superman, if you've got anything left in the tank, now's the time! Robin shouts as Ultra Morpho throws acid at him. But Metamorpho is suddenly there, transforming into sodium hydroxide to neutralize the acid and then create a lead dome to protect Superman. Where's Batman? Superman gasps, and everyone looks up as the walls suddenly explode to reveal Batman wearing an armor made out of the Metal Men. Making an entrance. <laughs> Rex laughs, and Batman rushes forward, punching Ultra Morpho in the face. Whatever you are, get away from my friend. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., the Doom Patrol are fighting against an android known as the Mechanic, who claims that the robot revolution has begun. The team continues their battle, but Cliff Steele is suddenly overtaken, his eyes glowing as he turns against his team. Back at Ivo's, Batman continues to pummel Ultra Morpho in his new battle armor, but he realizes that he can't defeat the robot alone. He's learning to adapt to the fight! A one-on-one -on -one isn't going to finish him! Pile on! Batman orders, his armor suddenly transforming, and the Metal Men leaping off of Batman, launching into a combined assault against Ultra Morpho. We have to buy Superman some time! Gold shouts, but Superman is there, now wrapped up in a lead suit made by Rex Mason, punching Ultra Morpho in the face. But Ultra Morpho transforms, throwing acid on Rex, some of which splashes onto Robin's leg. The boy wonder screams in pain, falling away as Ultra Morpho transforms part of his body into gas laced with kryptonite. Superman and Batman begin to cough as they drop to the floor, the android grabbing a hold of the world's finest and flying away. Instead of pursuing them, Gold orders the Metal Men to grab Rex and Robin and get them to safety. Meanwhile, over in Colorado, the challengers of the Fantastic are suddenly attacked by Ultivac. Ultivac's not autonomous! Who the hell's pulling his strings? The professor shouts as he hefts a bazooka onto his shoulder. Bazooka now! Questions later! Red Ryan shouts. But later, back with Rex and Robin, they awaken in the woods. The metal men standing guard over them. Yay, hey, where'd you take us, you lousy cowards? You ran away? Rex snaps at them angrily. But the metal men explain that their job is to protect human life, and both Rex and Robin were near death. Fine, we're fixed! Time for round two. Rex snaps as he gets to his feet, but Robin shakes his head, pointing out that they wouldn't survive another fight against Ultra Morpho, that they need to get the help of their friends. He puts in a call to the Titans, but the team of teenage superheroes is busy fighting against an awesome threesome off the coast of Maine. Robin nods, ending the call. Damn it, everybody split up and bring back whoever you can find, Robin says as the group disperses to look for help. Meanwhile, Superman finally awakens to find Batman standing over him offering a helping hand. Welcome back to the land of the living, Cal. He tells him, and Superman stands there to find both the heroes wearing inhibitor collars. Courtesy of our captor, we're all wearing them. Batman explains his emotions to the factory around them, where the masters of robotics are all working. Superman turns to find Ivo standing nearby. What's going on here, Ivo? This is all you're doing? You think you can hold this prisoner? Superman demands as he whirls Ivo around, but Ivo is also wearing a collar telling Superman to be quiet. You've got to free us! I built him, but I'm no longer in control! He whispers. But the shock suddenly runs through the collar, and Ivo hits the ground, screaming in pain until he passes out. 
Batman questions whether this could be Amazo's work, but Superman emotions to the corner. Amazo's not gloating. He's not stealing powers. He's working, same as the rest of them. Superman says, when suddenly electricity pours through Batman and Superman's collars, dropping them to the ground. The pair look up to see a new model of Amazo standing over them. Amazo was a plaything, a soulless doll capable of so little. I am the child of Ivo and Magnus. I am New Mazo, and I will end the human race, New Mazo says to the both of them. Meanwhile, Robin is driving through Gotham City, trying to get a hold of any heroes that can help. But as he tries to warn Supergirl, the Batmobile suddenly begins to drive off on its own. And Robin's eyes widen as the car is steering him directly to a wall. The story of the robot uprising and the world of Batman and Superman is not over. But if you want to know what's going to happen next, make sure you subscribe. Because today's story is to be continued.